Imagine something really small. The smallest things that you can see with your own eyes. Perhaps a crystal of salt, or maybe the tip of a hair, or the antenna on the head of an insect. All these things are really small, but there's a limit to what we can see with the human eye. And that limit is 100 micrometers, 10 times smaller than a millimeter. Then again, in life science, we study cells, bacteria, viruses, and these are much smaller than that. Hundreds, sometimes thousands times smaller than a millimeter. So how come we know what they look like? We know this because we can make use of microscopes. And a microscope will give you a magnified image of all those things which are supposed to be invisible to us. Now, microscopes have been around for a very long time already, for centuries. And actually, let me take you back to the 17th century, to Antony van Leeuwenhoek. He was very important for microscopy, and he's also very important for science. Now, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek was actually a textile merchant. And to convince his clients that his products were of good quality, he would show it to them with magnifying glasses. So they would see all the little details. And at some point, he started to build his own little microscopes, just like the one that you see there. Now, for me, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, he is not a textile merchant. He's a life scientist, because he was very curious about all the living things around him. He would examine everything he would get his hands on with his little microscopes. He looked at insects, he looked at leaves from plants, he even looked at a drop of his own blood. And he was the very first person to see red blood cells. Now, that's a scientific breakthrough, because he could see things that no one had ever seen before. Now, he also made drawings of all that, just like you see there in the middle. And that's important, because these drawings could be shared with others. That's actually scientific data. These are snapshots of what biology looks like. But what if Anthony didn't have a microscope? He would not have been able to satisfy his scientific curiosity. Actually, probably he would never have asked those questions in the first place. And that's an example how technology and science go hand in hand. If you don't have a technology, you can't answer any questions, and you may not even come up with any new ones. Now, in modern sciences, what we do all the time is make use of a technology to answer a scientific question. Of course, a lot has changed since the 17th century. We know a lot more. And a modern scientist will focus on one particular domain, one particular subject. I've worked in the research lab of VIB for several years myself. And what was interesting for me was to learn to understand how the cells of the skin work and what they have to do to form this organ that protects our body. And what I would do every day in the lab is make use of technology. Sometimes I use microscopes, but there's many other techniques out there that give us information. We have technology that gives us information on DNA, techniques to look at proteins. Now, of course, the technologies as such also evolve constantly. In microscopy, for instance, we can do a lot more than simply making snapshots. We now have microscopes that allow us to follow cells over time so that we can spy on them day and night, as if we had a webcam that would follow them and that we have more information than just what they look like, we are able to get information on their behavior. Now, sometimes we can even add compounds that will light up when something special is happening. That gives us even more in-depth information. So as technology moves along, we can answer new questions and we can come to know new scientific breakthroughs. Now, because there is so much technology out there and because each technique becomes more and more complicated, it's a big challenge for the scientists to keep up with that and at the same time also focus on the scientific question. And what we see is that research institutes have changed the way they are organized because of that. We have different research labs that will focus on a scientific question. And we also now see that institutes are investing in core facilities. And in a core facility, you have a team of people that will be experts in a certain technology. 
It can be microscopy, it can be another technique. Now, a couple of years ago, I switched from working in a research lab to such a core facility for microscopy. And the two jobs are quite different. In the research lab, I would focus on the scientific question. In a core facility, I focus on what is going on in microscopy. And I offer it to the scientists from different fields, not only skin biology, but also brain research, plant biology, cancer research, inflammation research, and so on. And now the technology and the science are brought together because people start to collaborate. They work together. It's a team effort. Now, the ev evolutions in technology are still going on every day. And a while back, we were asked to image a cell at very high detail in three dimensions. The technology exists. You can make images of a cell, get a lot of detailed information, and then the purpose is that we want to see all the objects in three dimensions, so that eventually we will be able to walk around in the cell and look at all those ob objects in 3D. Now, the images that you see here come from the microscope. And if we want to visualize this yellow structure here, then this is the end result in three dimensions. What you see here is the membrane around the nucleus in the cell. And the nucleus is this compartment that contains the DNA. Now, what you see here is that it's quite different from the image that we have from the microscope. And it was a big challenge for us to come from the previous images to this one. What we realized as technologists and as scientists is that we reached a bit the boundaries of what we could do. And to be able to do this, we actually needed people that have skills that, for instance, now work in industry where they make video games. That's not the scientists or the technologists, because we're, not sim we're simply just not trained for that. So what we did was collaborate with people that have the right skills. And those are the mathematicians, the computer scientists, the informaticians. There's a very big need for informaticians in research institutes, because data handling and data analysis are very high on the challenges in modern sciences. Now, I switched from working in the research lab to core facility, but I'm not the only person that has done that. We see that there's an enormous increase in the number of jobs in core facilities. The jobs have doubled in less than five years' time. And actually, we do need support functions in institutes. In an institute of about 1,500 people, 20% of the jobs are there to support the scientists. It can be core facilities, it can be logistics, it can be administration. Now, what I also want to come back to is that we don't only have to work together with those informaticians. There's other areas of expertise which we have to connect to. Many disciplines have to come together. One example is the chemists, the engineers. They have to help us to adjust the technology that we have today so that we are ready to use it for the questions of tomorrow. We need to work together with medical doctors that see patients in the clinic every day and they have to tell us what the next burning questions are and they also have to help us to bring our findings back to the patients. We need lawyers to protect our discoveries we need communication managers so that we can inform the public about what is going on in life science. Now, I don't have a technology that allows me to look into the future. Perhaps some of you are studying life sciences and you might end up working in the Life Science Research Institute. Perhaps you're not studying life sciences. You might also end up working in such an institute. Because I'm really convinced that all these disciplines will have a future in science. Thank you.